Hello, welcome to this week's videos advertising some of the latest publications that we've got coming out. I'm Dr. Tobias speaking and I'm here today to uh, give an interview with the two authors of this rather splendid new report which is called Deterrence in Cyberspace. We have Zoe Hawkins and Liam Neville who've been scribing away on this piece of work um, and now it's been released they're here to share some of their thinking and have a bit of a discussion around some of the content on this piece so perhaps if I can kick off straight away Zoe um, I mean clearly deterrence is one of those key questions in the whole cyber policy discussion so so where did your motivations come from for, for producing this piece? Thanks Toby yes as you mentioned um, cyberspace is increasingly being used um, by both state and non-state actors for malicious means. And in response to that, we're seeing um, a lot of national strategies and also um, government rhetoric really employing the idea of, of deterrence um, in response. Um, and I mean, most, most significantly, we're seeing the sort of Cold War idea of deterrence by punishment, so that idea of putting forward threats in an attempt to stem that flow of malicious activity. Um, but also, um, the more sophisticated governments are also discussing that idea of denial, so like reducing the benefits of those activities for for those malicious actors. What we wanted to do was sort of um, assess the effectiveness of both of those approaches um, in order to put a bit of clarity around um, the policy relevance of that sort of more traditional idea of deterrence and how that actually can be effectively applied um, to cyberspace. And Liam, do you, do you think it, it is an effective concept to be applied in cyberspace? Is it plausible? Because again, that's being the real contested discussion here is, you know, is, is this the land of make-believe or could we achieve deterrence in cyberspace? Sure. Well, I mean, deterrence comes into two types. There's deterrence by punishment, where you threaten someone with a response to an action. Or there's deterrence by denial, where you deny the benefit of what they're doing through your own actions. Um, we think that deterrence by punishment isn't actually an effective framework for creating a more stable, stable cyberspace. Um, there's a lot of issues with employing a threat uh, deterrent framework. Um, firstly, it's very difficult to define a red line or a threshold at which you would respond due to uh, a lack of real world, real world examples and uh, the lack of clarity around language to describe events that happen in cyberspace. Um, secondly, there is an issue in attributing actions in cyberspace. It's often easy to either cloud or hide who you are, or to at least create sufficient doubt to make it difficult to justify a reaction to something that happens in cyberspace. Lastly, there is also the issue that because this is a new area of international security, there isn't a normative framework to guide what is an appropriate and proportional response to an incident in cyberspace. So. Those things combined mean that if you, if you establish a threat framework for deterrence, you can put yourself in a position where you either have to carry through with your threat at the risk of international stability, or not carry through to maintain international stability, but that actually undermines your overall deterrence policy and, and threshold. So um, as, a, a, as a unique paradox for a, an actor when they implement that sort of policy that they have to act one way or the other, and both will be negative, mm. have a negative effect on their interest. And um, so, a follow-up question I wanted to ask on that front is, um, you know, on the on the front cover of your special report, you got a picture of a nuclear explosion there, and deterrence theory really comes from Cold War constructs of. Uh, nuclear weaponized states, it was very easy to understand who had nuclear weapons, who didn't. So creating a deterrence construct very easy. Whereas in cyberspace, that's a very different matter. And you raised the issue of attribution. So I wanted to ask the question, is deterrence plausible or possible if you cannot actually attribute the source of the attack? Sure. There is a risk if you can't attribute and act in cyberspace accurately that you could uh, inadvertently escalate and act um, an incident with the wrong actor, or the wrong state, or the wrong um, group of states. Um, the other risk is that by failing to attribute that act correctly, then you further undermine your deterrence posture because they were other states and aggressors may realise that you don't have the capability to actually investigate these things to the extent necessary to get very good attribution. Mm -hmm. There is some always some contextual. Um, evidence for who may have uh, conducted something in cyberspace, but as I said noted before, it is very easy to cloud the actual um, person behind something. 
So I think that brings us rather neatly into some of the real world examples that we're seeing going on right now. And so maybe you could reflect on what you've written in, in the light of what's currently going on in the US with uh, accusations of Russian meddling with the election there, the kinds of responses that we've heard from Trump, which are really rather confusing to encourage another state to actually conduct cyber espionage. So I wonder, how, how do you apply uh, you know, some of the, the theory that you've got here into some of those real world examples? It, again, is it plausible? It, it, is this kind of construct plausible in, in the current state of affairs? Yeah, absolutely. Well, this is a really great example because, um, firstly, it actually demonstrates a lot of the issues that we are trying to highlight in this report, which is, firstly, the sort of weakness of some of those threat frameworks that the US, as one of the sort of strongest cyber actors in cyberspace, has already put out, and yet that didn't actually deter this incident from happening. So that's one thing. Also, just mentioning the language that used by Trump, I think that this incident also brings to light some of the issues that Liam mentioned about um, terminology and that work that needs to be done in terms of um, clarifying that this, as you mentioned, is cyber espionage, but obviously a lot of people are describing it as a cyber attack and cyber war, and that obviously brings with it very different response frameworks. But I think coming out of this report um, with the DNC hack in particular, um, our discussions have led us to thinking that obviously a response is necessary, but as Liam mentioned, um, hitting back in cyberspace does carry a lot of risks in terms of the attribution. And in this case in particular, there has been a lot of toing and froing over the um, culprit, whether it be uh, a Romanian hacker, a lone hacker, or, or uh, Russian government intelligence. So we would instead suggest, um, as our report sort of outlines, policy responses that focus more on um, you know, making international consensus around what is and isn't acceptable in cyberspace. So the opposite of what Trump is doing, which is encouraging sort of other governments to interfere in, in uh, elections, um, but instead generating that sort of normative agreement that this is unacceptable and that's a long-term effort um, along with other confidence building measures um, to sort of prevent um, and work defensively against these issues rather than risk escalating them with threats. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, so, so many live discussions in, in cyber policy right now, but that, that, that whole concept of what the limitations of at very least state use of, of aggressive cyber action should be is, is incredibly live, and still we don't have agreed um, limitations on, on what that means. Liam, building on uh, what Zoe's just spoken about there, perhaps you could give us your top three policy recommendations as you've stated in the report. Sure. So we don't, states shouldn't make deterrent threats in cyberspace. They should invest in strong and resilient cyber networks and they should work with the international community to develop international norms and confidence building measures for cyberspace. Great stuff. Well, you can read all about this and more in this new report. Um, any feedback that anyone might have would be welcomed indeed, but uh, let me just say thank you to Zoe and Liam for your thank hard you. work. Thank it's you. a fabulous report. Thank you very thank much. You.